Education Associate for APRA Headquarters, I would like to welcome you to today's GGNA Online Solution Showcase, Performing a Portfolio Scrub. Today's presenters are Kat Benakis, Senior Director at GGNA Analytics, and Laura DiVicenzo, Associate Director of Prospect Management at the University of Delaware. Kat heads the GGNA practice area in prospect management and research. Laura has served in a variety of systems, prospect research, and prospect management roles at the University of Delaware. Just a few housekeeping items before we get, begin. Please keep in mind that a recording of this broadcast will be available for purchase in the online store by the end of the day today. Feel free to submit questions throughout the event via the question and answer box on your webinar toolbar. Our speakers will pause for questions throughout the presentation and address unanswered questions at the end. Following the event, you will be asked to evaluate today's session. Your feedback is greatly appreciated. And with that, I would like to welcome today's presenters. Welcome, Kat and Laura. Hey, thanks, Melanie. Hi, everyone. This is Kat Banakis. As Melanie said, I'm with uh, Grunzenbach Lear & Associates. And I am joined today by my friend and colleague, Laura DiVincenzo, at the University of Delaware. Hi, everyone. And we are super excited uh, to have this opportunity to chat with all of y'all today about uh, doing what I like to call a portfolio scrub. And uh, we're, we're going to go through it in terms of concept and then DIY of what it actually is sort of the nuts and bolts of what it looks like when you do it. Um, you may have actually done something like this at your organization. We, we call it a portfolio scrub. Maybe you call it something else. Um, but I think that uh, any sort of house cleaning like this and, and getting on top of things can be really uh, powerful. So the way we're going to do it, Laura and I will go back and forth, kind of talking about what it's been like, so on and so forth. Pop in your questions whenever you have them. Uh, we'll try to answer them um, as we go through. And um, hopefully this will be pretty interactive. That'll make it all the more interesting. And we'll be sure uh, to honor the time that we have together. Um, so as Melanie said, uh, I'm here with GGNA. I get to work with prospect management and research, and I have been lucky enough to do a portfolio scrub, as we like to call them, uh, at a bunch of organizations, most recently at the University of Delaware, at uh, University of North Carolina, at Chapel Hill, Kenyon, um, Brandeis, and a bunch of other places. Laura, is there anything you want to say before we get going? Uh, no, I think that once we get going, we'll um, I'll probably have some insights. Cool. All right. So, uh, first thing here is is why you'd want to do something like what we're calling a portfolio scrub. In part because it helps with uh, management tools in terms of being able to forecast what gifts are likely to close, which gift officers are performing well and poorly, who's got good prospects, whether someone has really crummy prospects and another person has really great prospects but they're being held to the same metrics, what staffing needs are, even what your travel budget is going to be for this. And um, henceforth, we enter uh, what we call the portfolio scrub. Um, Laura, would you take a minute and talk a little bit about what the situation was at Delaware that prompted you to want to do the project? Sure. So at University of Delaware, we were in, or still are, in the silent phase of a campaign. And we wanted to get some kind of an idea of our por prospect portfolios and our pools just to make sure that we had the right alignment of prospects to gift officers and if they were the right prospects for the, the right gift officers. So that's what prompted the, um, the, the exercise with GG&A. Um, and in addition, they also screened our entire database because that hadn't been done. It had been over five years uh, that we had had a wealth screening. So it was kind of a twofold um, project. And the the timing in terms of um, 
doing it before a campaign is great because you're cleaning house, you're getting ready, you're able to see things and assess you know, where a point is. But if you're on a long campaign, you might want to do something like this midpoint just to see whether you're going to be able to finish the campaign in the way that you thought because you're going to be able to do a little bit of, of forecasting. Um, one of the things that I think is really neat about doing a process like this, and maybe my favorite part of it, is that yes, you're going to come out with a bunch of great reports and tables and data, um, but the thing you don't necessarily foresee happening but that can happen is a real power dynamic and relationship change. Because to go through the process like this, you have leadership involved, you have gift officers, you have prospect management and prospect research, and people from the reporting side of things all together in a room figuring these things out. And when it happens and you're working together on this over a period of time, it is such a collaborative project that inevitably you're working towards a common goal and it can be a really neat way to have uh, a common strategic vision in place. So um, I think that that's one of the things you don't necessarily think about when you're going into doing something really operational, but can be a very uh, wonderful outcome. Can I say something, Kat, too, about yeah. that? Yeah. So the one thing that I noticed uh, that happened here is our research and gift officer monthly meetings became much more strategic because we had, uh, at the time we were doing the scrub, we had, like you said, all those people at the table and then they became part of the process going forward. So that was what I think that we really developed a good, a better relationship with all those people involved. Can you say a little bit about like, in the meetings before um, like what the role of research was and then what it was in the meetings after? Sure. <clears throat> Excuse me. So in the meetings prior, um, it was basically, you know, what stage are your prospects in? What can I help you with in contact uh, information? Um, where are you traveling and uh, what events? So it was more of a, I almost want to say like a record keeper, kind of a tracking role, mm -hmm. whereas now um, we are helping more with the prospect management piece of it. So we had timelines in our policies prior, but we didn't really um, enforce them. So now we have uh, senior management in place to help enforce that with us so that we're looking now at uh, their pools, their assigned pools, and making sure that they're seeing all the prospects that GG&A has said, hey, these are the better prospects, you need to go see them. And we also had the backup of GG&A saying, you know, we did the model and these prospects are rated A. Um, you need to go see these people. There were some false A's in there that we, um, sure. of course, yeah, that's going to happen, but uh, it really helped beef up what research was presenting to the gift officers in terms of prospects. That's great. And and by no means are we uh, trying to do a sales pitch here of, of buying the modeling, um, but but glad that it was helpful there as well. And I love that that brings out um, how it is that you could sort of change the conversation okay. from being reactive and please change this person's such and such to, okay, what do we need to do to help this person close? and how can we keep on time. Right. Um, I'm going to uh, jump in. That is a great transition. Um, we're going to go through three steps here, guys. And this is a great transition to what actually happens in the review. Um, I'm going to pause really quickly because I'm having a, a wee technical thing. And I want to make sure ah, that I'm getting everyone. So if you all could bear with me one second. Okay. All right, super. Um, and there is a question about um, the slides being available after the webinar. Yes, the slides will be available after the webinar. And not only that, um, I have found this process to be uh, so exciting and so much fun that uh, I actually wrote a white paper on it 
and that will be available to you after the webinar as well. So plenty of materials to work from. Cool. All right. So uh, before you begin, um, it's super helpful to have a person who's in a position of leadership explain why you're doing something like this. Um, because it's going to be a lot of work, and it's going to be a group process, even if it's instigated by someone who's not in a position of leadership, which I think is fantastic. Uh, sometimes it helps to have that voice at the top to say, we're doing this because we need to be able to forecast for the campaign. Here's what it is. Here's why we're doing it. And to kind of set the tone that it's going to happen, because there is going to be sweat involved and some homework and all of that. Uh, you also want to provide each gift officer um, whose portfolio you're going to review with a definition sheet in terms of uh, what you mean by stages, what you mean by anything else that you're going to be looking at or adding into their portfolio going forward on their prospects. Um, and then as Laura alluded to, it really helps to have some sort of capacity rating and some sort of inclination rating. Um, in part because this is a great opportunity to ask your gift officers to verify that. You know, the, the research rating is X, but the gift officers met with that person. They have way more, they have way less, whatever it is, so that you can temperature check on it. Um, and it's also, an opportunity to not just have it be by gut and emotion, right? Having some sort of capacity rating gives you something kind of hard to start with. Um, and an inclination rating also to be able to have those two axes of how much someone has, how much they love you. And then um, you, the, the way that we do it, you might do it a different way in, in your institution, but the way that we've done it, you just sit down in a series of meetings, and in each meeting, you've got um, someone from Advancement Services and reporting so that they can be t uh, keeping track of what reports and dashboards you might need coming out of it, someone from Prospect Research, someone from Prospect Management. Um, in many of your institutions, that may be one person who wears all hats, so you'll have some long days. Um, and then that person from campaign leadership or the gift officer's manager, someone there um, to, to communicate that this is serious and that it's related to the goals of the institution. And then you project on a screen um, from a laptop, you may have printouts also, uh, each gift officer's portfolio. And unfortunately, you know, you try to put an Excel with a lot of things up here on the slide. You don't get everything. But basically what you're, what um, you want to have up there is some amount of the basic relationship, their giving, uh, the basic capacity the stage they're in, hopefully the time they've been in the stage, and uh, then these orange boxes are what you want to have as the outcome. So you're going through name by name and saying, is this person still in cultivation or should they be, you know, moved to solicitation? Maybe there's a proposal in there for them. Is the capacity rating right? And then do you want to keep them? And if you do want to keep them, what's your strategy for next step with them? What's the date on that strategy? And when are you going to see them? Um, the, the point of reference that we use at GGNA is that if someone's in your portfolio, you should be able to see everyone in your portfolio over like a two-year period. So when in the next two years are you going to be able to see them? What's your trip planning? If you have one person in Anchorage, you're probably not going to be able to necessarily get a trip out of Alaska. My, my apologies to anyone who's uh, in the webinar and is in Juneau. Um, some of you may be there. But uh, for, for many of us, that would be a haul. And, but then you know as an institution, man, we've got one great prospect in Alaska. Maybe we can put together a Canadian and Pacific Northwest 
um, far trip on that. And then it's sort of a it's a group thought on what you do to get to that person, um, which is super helpful for travel planning. Whatever you don't, so you're just going through name by name. Do you want to keep them? You want to drop them? What would you need to do for them? Um, and and Laura, maybe you can talk to like what the actual process was like. Right. So at these meetings, um, we did go through line by line, name by name, and uh, it really helped to clean out the prospects that they were just holding on to for one reason or another. Um, it could be that they hadn't gotten in contact with them or had not been able to reach them or they had tried and just didn't want to give them up. So having the this information right in front of them, we were able to kind of clean out their prospects. So yeah, we would go through line by line. And our systems and reporting guys um, were able to do an automatic upload of these for us because then um, you know we would have been left with having to enter these manually to in the system. So by having, like we said before, all those people in the room doing this, it helped us to then gain some automation to help our department update these changes. And if I remember correctly, there was uh, a little bit of homework associated with it that if you didn't get to, if you didn't get through all the names, adding on the strategy and the time you were going to see them and travel and all of that, that was sort of something that they input on a spreadsheet and got back to the systems people within three weeks or a month or something like that. Right, right. Um, and that's really nice because then also everyone's starting, the homework isn't nice, <laughs> the process being nice, because then you're starting from a common point of, okay, this is when we're tracking strategy dates from. This is when we're tracking um, how, when we're going to see the travel uh, planning. And this is when you asked for research on things. Um, great question here, which is how long were the meetings with uh, each development officer? Um, 45 minutes. So we gave ourselves 10 or 15 minutes in between each. They were 45 minutes. Um, you get through as many as you can. It gets fast uh, because as soon as you've done like a dozen or so, there's a little back and forth of what do we mean by this? What do we mean by that? Bah, bah, bah. And then it um, goes pretty quickly after that. Um, the other thing that comes up in these that uh, is actually in the white paper also is a question around when is it okay to drop someone, right? You've, someone's tried to call them 13 times, they're non-responsive, and you know, it's certainly more art than science as to when it's okay to drop a non-responder. Um, but some people may not want to give up prospects. They may want to keep them in the portfolio. And that's an important uh, conversation to have with the leadership folks there. When is that okay to happen to give people permission to slough off lower folks and get potentially more interested people in there? So. If you do look at the white paper later, it has a whole article in there of uh, when you can consider someone a non-responder. It's not definitive. It's just things to consider in there. So what you get on the, on the back end is a strategy with a date, a stage and time, the rating, the travel plan, and necessary research requests which is a really nice bit of data to have. But as we know, data on its own um, gives us only so much. It's, it's how much we can see the data and work with it in different ways. And so here are some typical reports uh, that come out of this. Uh, aging strategy, date since last contact, time and stage. Um, if you don't track already the number of recommended days in stage, this is one of the most powerful things um, that you can do in terms of tracking because it really lets you see someone who's been in stewardship over two years, sometimes with good cause, sometimes so maybe time for recultivation. Uh, someone who's been hanging out in qualification and not actually making contact 
four years, you know, whatever it is, so that you can really look at that. Um, when they were last contacted, and as we've talked about, the travel budget and plan. And then you can see it in terms of who are someone's prospects by stages. Um, one of the things that happened at Delaware was, you know, it totally differed by gift officer. There were some gift officers who everyone they had was in cultivation or solicitation, and they needed a lot of new prospects. They were churning through. There were other gift officers where their entire portfolio was in qualification. They were new, they had a new portfolio, they had, uh, you know, things had changed. And so it really allowed um, Laura's team to be able to see, oh, these are all different internal clients who have really different needs in terms of feeding prospects. Uh, and you can also see by uh, capacity and inclination, um, what the pool is overall. You know, these people are assigned, these people are unassigned. You may see that there are a bunch of folks who um, are high capacity, high inclination, unassigned. You, but the opposite could be true also. I just did one of these at another institution, and they came out of it, and you know, we did the final analysis and said, we have everyone with capacity and any inclination assigned. If we're going to get any new gifts, it's going to have to be someone with whom we don't already have a relationship. And also, there's not a high capacity pipeline coming in through here. You know, 30 seconds of disappointment, on the other hand, so much better to know than to try to be forecasting a campaign when maybe you don't have the prospects. Anything you want to add, Laura? So just looking at this chart reminded me of uh, some of the things that we had to work through to um, make some sense of this, these numbers. But um, initially, we were quite pleased, though, with the numbers here that we tended it looked like we had you know, the good prospects in the right area. Um, there were just 403 prospects that should not have been assigned based on their rating and their inclination because they were D and E and low rated. So we have actually gone through those and we've managed to, um, I'm trying to find my numbers here, we have managed to get that number down to 349 now. So wow. we've given up some of those prospects um, and added new ones in portfolios so that they have a better, better prospect. Um, and then the 742 high priority, um, you know how I mentioned earlier that some of those were false A's. They look sure. really good um, digitally, but it could be that they gave a, mil a, mo a memorial gift uh, 10 years ago, 5 years ago, and they have no loyalty or no inclination towards UD. It was for the memory of someone. Mm -hmm. um, so after we cleaned that out, we had 554 high priority unmanaged. Um, that we have a been able to assign, and now we have, where's my chart here? Uh, now we are down to 536 that we're still looking at um, that are either have, or we haven't gotten down to the 100,000 level yet. So we have been able to clean up the top part and find out why they weren't assigned and assign them if needed. That is amazing progress. I mean, that was very enlightening. When did we? Um, oops, sorry, that was not that was not me. It just did that on its own. Um, <laughs> how how very I, we're close to Halloween, so maybe something's happening. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we did this what in like February? Right. Yes. Yeah. So that's a lot of work in six months. Right, and you had said that it would take probably a year, so there's still some work that we're doing. Um, that still, there's still still prospects that research needs to go qualify. I think there's 112, and um, there's 200 some that the gift officers still need to qualify. So it does truly take a year uh, once yeah. we look at stuff, get through all of it. So we had a great question here on um, how uh, what we're defining of identification and qualification. Um, your, 
you know, every <laughs> every institution is going to have its own definitions in some cases around uh, what you mean by between those two. So that's a great question. Um, generally, when I'm working with orgs, they use identification or discovery to mean those prospects who um, may be good, but no one's talked to them, had a meeting with them, had done anything to uh, be able to say whether they're interested in the organization, have some capacity, something like that. Um, they, you, your organization may or may not consider that cohort to be um, assigned even. It could be that until you see them, they can't be assigned to you until you talk to them, something like that. Um, qualification then would be the stage at which um, you really are trying to learn and where within the institution their interest lies, affirm that they're really interested in it before someone's starting to actively cultivate them for a gift. It could be that in one conversation someone moves from discovery or identification into cultivation, right? In one phone call you figure out like they kind of like us, they seem like they have the capacity to make a gift, and they're interested in this process project, we're going to start working towards that. Um, but the, the identification generally is like that pre-conversation point. Um, and Kat, can I add also that for us, um, the identification is likely, not all, but likely the ones that research has found and identified. So they're in the pools waiting for a gift officer. Uh, if they need a new prospect, they can go there to dip into that pool to grab a prospect. Then um, the qualification is more so a gift officer qualification. Um, so research has identified them, and then the gift officer now needs to qualify them through a visit before they can be assigned, mostly. And I think that that's so helpful also, what you guys have, that if, if you want someone, here are the people we've identified. And that right. way, uh, you know, sometimes you may still have to help with travel plans and that sort of thing, but right. what, what a great ready population that here's who you can pull from. Right, and that doesn't mean that they don't find people on their own or that names don't come up in a meeting that have not been identified, but uh, it's just a, a place that we put prospects who need work. Right. Yeah, I, I think it would it would be a totally flip thought thing and not the power dynamic we want if gift officers ever stopped, you know, taking their own referrals and finding people on their own. Right. You, you had to work yourself into being uh, too essential in someone's life. Uh, so we have just a couple minutes left here. If anyone has additional questions, pop those in. Um, the, the the theory, of course, and the cleaning out of the closet is um, one part of things. The harder part, of course, is the endurance for them executing on the strategies that everyone sets. Just because, well, I mean, there's probably a whole host of reasons, but among them is that you know this all hands on deck is really involving and it's kind of slap happy exhausting fun in its own way you're like we're moving through we're going to have all of this information and i i really like it but then i also i should mention i also am very committed to closet cleaning every season so it's probably more about me but then doing all of the follow up of um pipeline and reporting and keeping things on track so that it happens um, takes the um, longer the longer period of time. So knowing that, Laura, what is kind of the and you talked about this briefly, but I'm wondering if you could talk about what you have in your ongoing monthly meetings that's the the follow through on what the initial project was. Sure. So the monthly meetings now are, um, we keep track of the next steps that were mentioned at the meeting before. And then we present those at the following meeting just to see if there's been any movement. And really it, um, it brings to light that 
they either haven't done anything or the prospect wasn't um, receptive to anything. So we keep bringing that up. Whereas before, you know, they would say a next step, and it probably would not get recorded, or if it did, it got it got lost in the shuffle. So um, we become more strategic in that, in that we're trying to follow through on the next steps that are set at the meeting. And one of the things um, that I was really struck by in working with your team was um, how really proactive the research team was in saying. How can research help make that step a reality? You know, even if the answer was nothing, mm -hmm. <laughs> like offering the service of, do you need us to find out who their friends are? Like, what can we do to help here? And sometimes right. it was that nothing could be done particularly, but other times you could sort of see where it could be um, more strategic in there. Um, yes. Okay, two questions have come in. First one, um, do you assign for qualification? Um, meaning, I think the question is like, do you assign someone um, to a portfolio in order to be qualified, or do they have to have qualified the person to get them? What do you guys do? So what we do is they have to have a first visit first before they get assigned. Um, so the way that they kind of tag that prospect is with the contact report that they have a scheduled visit. Um, mm -hmm. And our gift officers are supposed to look through contact reports before they uh, reach out to anybody else so that hopefully they're doing that and not stepping on people's toes or each other's toes. So after their first um, meeting, if it's decided there that they want to work further with this prospect, then they can send a request to research for a request for assignment. And then that stage may or may not stay in qualification. Like you said earlier, it could go right to cultivation or it could stay in, in qualification. So it just depends on the first that first visit. Right, right. But we don't uh, assign until they've had a visit. Which I think is really smart. Um, because it keeps it, uh, it, it, it keeps the focus on who's active in the portfolio. Right. Right. You're not, you're not padding it. Um, and that connects to this other question that just came in of what are um, the portfolio sizes, um, which generally would be like 100 to 125 with the majority of them not in stewardship or qualification. <laughs> so that 100 to 125 is hoping for um, this bell curve. Because uh, if, if 90 of the 100 are in stewardship, that means you have 10 prospects in your portfolio. Um, and sometimes, of course, that size varies. What, what would you say would be the big to small for you? So we try to keep it capped at 150. Um, before we were having pools that were above 200, some were 300, and that's just you can't see all those prospects. So um, we lowered it to 150, and then if it's a more senior director of development, then that that may go down. Even so, our principal gift officer, when we do get one again, um, may have a portfolio of around 80 to 80 to 100 or 50 to 100, I should say. Right. And same if a person has management responsibilities, right. too. Yeah. Right. Um, okay. We have one last question. I want to honor our time here. Whoops. Um, and while we're answering this question, I want to just put this up if you have any questions for Laura and I um, following this. Um, oh, two questions, actually. Uh, one is from me. Um, so <laughs> the other is, um, what do you do, and this is a question for you, Laura, what do you do when a gift officer wants to keep a prospect when they haven't shown any inclination or, and are becoming cold? So someone wants so, to hold on to a crummy prospect. Right. So we had a lot of that, and that's why the pools were so high, uh, 200 to 300 people. And the modeling that GG&A did that gave us an inclination score um, was what helped give us power to say, why are you keeping that guy that's a D or an E when we could probably give you an A? Um, that really helped to give us uh, oomph when we said, get rid of that person. You've, if you've tried three or four times and he's an inclination of a D and E, there's no reason why he should be in your pool. Um, and 
there were still some gift officers who still kept cold prospects, though. And so that's the one sure. that, you know, I said we still have um, whatever the number was. We still have some that are in low priority that I think eventually is, and I'm, I'm really curious to read your white paper, Kat, on the um, things you can do, like five things you could do before you boot a prospect out of your pool, because I think that will help give them some concrete um, examples of what, you know, I've tried everything, and now I just need to let them go. So. And, and I think also that, like, reward option is so critical there. If really you're not able to offer them anyone better, then of course they're going to hold on to someone because right. they're like, well, at least this is the person I know, and it's not having to totally requalify. But if you really do have um, as a team, a pool of, we've got a great person we'd love to give you if you have room, right. then giving up someone who's been hard to access is a little easier. Um, Laura, last final thing. Um, did you want to... Um, yeah, you want me to yeah, yeah. talk about that? So one of the things, too, that uh, gg and did for us is when they came in, they said, you know what, you really need a position that um, does the prospect management piece of it because we really didn't. So we created a new position, and I, ha I was the director and decided to move into this new position. So with that said, that means now that our Director of Prospect Management Research is open. So if there's anybody out there that is uh, looking to come work at it with a great institution and a good team, um, I think it'll be on, well, it'll be on the University of Delaware website. Perfect. But if you have any questions, you can email me too. And I can tell you it is a lovely, lovely place. Um, and it's, it's near Philly. So you right. can you can fly there. Um, awesome. Well, thank you all so much for your time today. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Melanie, for putting it together. Um, as we said, we'll supply you with the deck and the paper and the materials. Um, and if you have any additional questions, feel free to reach out uh, to either of us individually. All right. And with that, I'm going to hand it back over to Ms. Melanie of APRA. Any closing thoughts from you, Laura? No, thanks to everyone, um, and Kat, too. Thanks for the opportunity. Great. Well, thank you both so much, and thank all, thank all of you for participating in this webcast. Please note that this webcast will be available for purchase in the online store by the end of the day today. We appreciate you, Kat and Laura, as well as everyone online for attending the event today. Please be sure to complete the online evaluation for today's event, which you will receive in a follow-up email. Your feedback and input are important and appreciated as we further develop our online solutions showcase program. Thank you again for attending and have a great day.